The Lord be with you. I hope you will allow me one minute of uh, personal comment here before I preach, and that's just to say what a great joy it is to be here at Asbury Seminary. I've been on the campus a number of times. I presented some workshops at the pastor's conference a number of years ago here in uh, some cold February morning, but it wasn't as cold as Indiana at the time. But uh, for various focus groups and occasions I've had to be here, for which I'm grateful, but I've never been a part of the seminary chapel, so this is a first for me, and I'm very grateful for that opportunity, and I thank you for that invitation. I look forward to being with you a number of months. So I greet you, first of all, in the name of our common, risen Lord, Jesus Christ. And I also bring greetings, uh, unofficial greetings, from Indiana Wesleyan University, and uh, so happy to see my students around surrounding me. They make me so proud. I'm sure that you've made them uh, more than what I was able to make them, but they're just fantastic examples of uh, leaders in, in worship and otherwise. I'm so grateful to be a part of them. A number of the people that I teach with in the School of Theology and Ministry at Indiana Wesleyan are graduates of Asbury Seminary, and we kind of seem to share people back and forth a little bit. I appreciate that collaboration very much because together we're sharing the mission of uh, preparing men and women to serve the kingdom of God. And so I, I'm just really, really thrilled to be here and so thankful that uh, Dr. Stamps would invite me. When he did call me and invite me to come, he suggested that I speak, preach on a topic related to worship. And uh, I will in tell you that I've come prepared to share what I would consider the most important thing I know about Christian worship. It's the, the central thing, the most critical thing, and I think it's becoming uh, the most challenging thing in some circles, even among so-called evangelical churches. So uh, today I'm going to share with you, I suppose, the, the burden of my heart. And to do that, I'm going to use one of uh, my favorite ac accounts from the gospel. Certainly, I think just a remarkable account, uh, the post one of the post-resurrection accounts from the gospels of Luke 24 that you just heard. And I think it's um, such an, an incredible story. The longer that I study this passage, it seems like there's stories within the story of this. Of this and it seems like you never quite, quite come to the bottom of, of Luke 24. But I'd like to... Uh, lead you in some thoughts from Luke 24. Because, you know, as it seems to always take me to the same place. No matter where I approach this passage, at which little spot, it seems to take me to the same place. And I don't think it's eisegesis. I think it's because this story takes us to the same place. And that is the reality, the reality of the presence of the risen Lord among his followers. And so in this season of Easter 2013, I'd like to share a few thoughts about that. Will you join me in prayer? Lord, now I ask that you will open my lips and that my mouth will declare your praise and that together this risen Lord who is in fact here this morning will be known among us in a new way through Christ our Lord and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I want to begin with a true story. Before I came to Indiana Wesleyan University, I was serving a large church in Hollywood, California, as Minister of Worship and Music. And I want to describe the sanctuary with you to you for a moment because it helps with the story, it helps make sense of the story. But in this large sanctuary, there were a seating in three sections, kind of like a fan of pews on the floor. And then around the outside of the balcony was a, a excuse me, around the perimeter, so to speak, of the pews, there was a, a balcony that went 360 degrees, really, around the entire seating. So it was a large balcony, I'm told, it seated around 1,000 people. And you could look across on the same level as the, at the top of the balcony from kind of like stem to stern, so to speak. And the choir that I directed was located in the balcony at the front. The clergy preached from a spot here, but the, the choir was above them. And as my position was located, I was in front of the choir seating and the front of the balcony. And so therefore, I could see, we could see straight across to the opposite side of the balcony and actually looked down upon the seating. 
Well, one Sunday morning, I was sitting in my spot at the front of the choir, located in the top of this balcony, and about 15 minutes into the service, I heard a very loud whisper from an alto. <laughs> and here's what I heard. There he is. Who? Bonham. Bonham? Bonham. <laughs> Where? <laughs> Center balcony. Back row. I don't see him. <laughs> Under the window. Oh my goodness, it's Bono. <laughs> Little pause. Pass it on. <laughs> so from there, the news of Bono's presence in worship moved down through the alto section into the sopranos, eventually circulating through the whole choir. OK, I admit it. I looked. I did. <laughs> I'm, I'm not too proud to tell you that. Somewhere after the opening hymn and before the pastoral prayer, I was looking for across the balcony for the guy with the tinted aviator I wear and hoping that I could locate him. It wasn't uncommon to have celebrities in church, and I'd been told that Bono had worshipped there on a number of occasions. I'm sure he liked the choir, which is why he came. <laughs> I doubt it. We had a well-known uh, preacher that he's, he really enjoyed. When we started worship, though, we had no idea that one of the most popular rock stars in the world was in the congregation. And then we discovered his presence. But here's the irony. Apparently, Bono was in church to seek the presence of the one who really mattered. And, who made, and in fact, we were captivated with the presence of someone that made no difference whatsoever in worship. And perhaps because that's like the disciples and us on the road to Emmaus, maybe we too, really have no idea who we are actually with after all. When we gather to worship, in fact, we are with someone. And we are with the risen Lord in all of his fullness. Well, as you heard and as you know, the travelers on the road to the village of Emmaus the evening of the resurrection had no idea whom they were with. They were exhausted and they were frustrated and they were clueless. It had been a rough few days in Jerusalem. They were disciples of Jesus. They had witnessed his murder, his torture, and they now felt like fools because they had believed him. They had believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And they had left all to follow him. And they had bought into this theory that he was the one who would bring in the kingdom of God. And now all hope was gone because the Messiah was gone, it was over. And they had no idea that they were now with the person that they had just left for dead a few, a few days before. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? We read this, and, and I can remember even as a young child thinking, how could they not know him? They knew him well. And he's right there talking to them, and yet they did not know it. It's like he's there, but they don't see him. He's there. He's there. He's there, but they don't see him. Well, after listening to them, Jesus addresses their concerns, and he explains the reason for it all, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interprets to them the things about himself and all the scriptures. And this didn't seem to help much. They were as confused as ever, and they still had no idea whom they were with. Yet this conversation with the stranger seems to mean something, that's for sure. They're just not exactly sure what it means. And so they invite him to hang around a little bit longer. They pleaded with him, please stay with us. And he did. And then I think a very, very odd thing happens because while at table, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and he gave it to them. But I think it's odd because he's the stranger. He's the stranger serving them in their own home. He, the guest, became the ultimate host. But it was at that moment that Christ was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. And then their eyes were opened, and then they recognized him. 
the very real presence of their very real risen Lord was with them all along. They just hadn't known it. And it was afterwards, of course, that they noted, wait a minute, I, our hearts had been burning within us all the while that Jesus was with them on the way. And it was then that they had realized that their story had been unfolded into God's story. And their lives would never be the same. I think the same would be true of their worship. I bet their worship was never the same. In fact, every account of the worship of the first century church will tell you that the defining mark was a dynamic understanding of the real presence of the risen Lord at worship. And I think it would change our worship as well. I think this Emmaus story is a window into the importance of the real presence of Jesus Christ in Christian worship. You see, the real presence of the living Lord has everything to do with Christian worship. Maybe we should begin at the beginning and ask what exactly is worship? It might be easier to say what it's not. I kind of like to argue from what things are not. Christian worship isn't music. Have you noticed lately that we use the word worship and music interchangeably as if they mean the same thing? We talk about having a good time of worship, and of course what we're really referring to is whether we like, we like the great band that led our songs or we like the music that was sung. We call music worship as if the sermon or the offering or the prayers are not worship. Shame on us. Music is a wonderful avenue for expressing our worship. I'm a musician who's given many years to church music ministry, but it isn't the sum total of our worship. And we should not confuse the terms. And worship isn't a program either. A lot of the churches I visit today offer what I call program worship. A program is basically a general sequence of events presented by some performers or some educators in front designed to instruct or entertain the public for a, speci a special topic or purpose. And for decades, worship in many places has resembled a religious program. There's a topic, and the topic is God. A great topic, I might add. And we sing about God, or we tell about God, or we discuss God with the idea that God is listening in. Another attendee at the program. We put in order a sequence of events designed to instruct or entertain the public about our topic, this wonderful topic of God. And we arrange for the performers, hoping that they will add an effective dimension to the program and that more people will come to our nice little God program next week. But here is the very point at which we have gone astray. And I think it's related to the prepositions. When I was a child studying grammar in the fifth grade, I, I really struggled with grammar. I probably still do to some degree. We had to learn what prepositions were all about, and I learned that a preposition is a word that indicates the relationship between the noun and the other words in the sentence. And I can remember my parents, who are both English majors in college, they were trying to help me. And they taught me that a preposition was all of the ways that a dog could be in relationship with the doghouse. A dog can be on the house, go around the house, lay by the house, run through the house, be in the house. You get it. Prepositions are a little more involved in that, but my parents' oversimplified explanation helped me out. Well, Christian worship is not a program about God. God is not the topic of our gathering. Christian worship is not a musical concert where God is the subject of the songs. These kind of models don't begin to resemble biblical worship. They are far from it. And that's because we're using the wrong prepositions. Worship isn't about God. Worship is with God. And it's with God, get ready for 
more prepositions, through Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, there's a presence in the room, and I mean a real presence, really, a real presence, a live presence, every time that we gather. But like the disciples, so often we have no idea that he's there. We're clueless. Our eyes have been kept from recognizing him. In Christian worship, we lay aside the program model because the story model, the, mo the program model, doesn't, isn't indicative of biblical worship. Instead, we pick up the story model. And by that, I don't mean that every Sunday we start with Genesis and not that, but Revelation, although I've known a few pastors who have done that. I simply mean that when the community gathers, we're all called to step into this ongoing story of God to celebrate it, to proclaim it, to rejoice in it, to rehearse it, to live in the story of God as a community. And the most important thing I can tell you about worship as the story of God is simply this, that the presence of Jesus Christ is the centerpiece of our worship because Jesus Christ is the heart of the story by God's design. It is God's will that his son is the centerpiece of Christian worship. Is worship Trinitarian? Yes. Is it Christocentric? Yes. And the two do not fight each other. Christ is everything that is important about our worship. Though he is physically seated at the right hand of the Father this very moment, it turns out that he is fully present to us as a worshiping community. It turns out that through the Holy Spirit, Christ, the risen Lord, is fully, 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 and really present, present here with us. And he's remarkably fully present in every worshiping community at once. Do I understand how? No. Could I explain that? No. It's a mystery. It's incomprehensible, but it doesn't change the reality of the truth, that the real presence of the resurrected Lord is fully with us, and you may be surprised in discovering at what way Christ is fully present to us and with us. Did you know that the scriptures refer to Christ as our worship leader? That changes a few things. The writer of the book of Hebrews refers to Jesus as just that, our later Gas, our worship leader, Hebrews 8. In that same chapter, we discover that Jesus is our lead worshiper completely with us in worship, to lead our worship in ascending to the Father. You see, we need help in worshiping God. We need someone to take our weak and perfect worship and filter it and cleanse it into something strong and perfect and then present this worship to God for God's pleasure, a perfected worship. Only Christ, through the Holy Spirit, can do this. Jesus is the only one qualified to do this. He's appointed by God to do this. He's our worship leader, and this morning, whether you recognize him or not, not, he is doing just that. Exactly what is our Lord, the lead worshiper, doing? Well, he's praying our prayers for us. As our priest, the writer of Hebrews goes on to say that he lives forever to make intercession for us, for us. There's that preposition again. And Christ is taking our prayers, transforming them into perfect prayers, and lifting those to the Father. Hebrews chapter 2, Jesus is not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters. He's in worship, claiming us as his siblings, and offering our worship his and ours together to the Father. But that's not all. Our worship leader doesn't make things one directional. Christ is not only transforming the worship acts that we send to the Father. Hebrews 2 tells us that Jesus says, quoting Jesus, I will proclaim your name, God, 
speaking to God. I will proclaim your name, O God, to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. Amazing, Christ is also the messenger from God to us. In the midst of the worshiping congregation, our resurrected Lord is here calling us his brothers and sisters and sanctifying our every worship act so that they can be received by a holy God. And at the same time, he's proclaiming God's name to us, the perfect facilitator of bi-directional worship. People to God, God to people. Without him, we could not worship. We would have no way of worshiping. We wouldn't even have Christian worship in any way, shape, or form. The presence of Christ is a necessity for Christian worship. Our worship leader is not only praying our prayers for us, he's singing our songs with us. I was just thrilled to hear your singing this morning. Really, I was. You all sang like the risen Lord is here like you believe that, which I know that you do. It turns out that in Hebrews 2, Jesus also says, in the midst of the congregation, I will sing a hymn to you, speaking to God. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing a hymn to you, my Father. Jesus is singing our songs of praise with us to the Father. Now picture it. Jesus leading our song, not up front with some huge orchestra or flashy light show, simply standing in the middle of the gathered community, eyes uplifted, identifying with us, his brothers and sisters in worship, so that our worship is strengthened and perfected. You know, as you know, there are many religions in the world, and each with their standard of worship. Like ours, all of them offer prayers of some sort. All of them have their rituals of some sort. All have their appointed meeting times. All have their authoritative texts, be they oral or written. But what is Christian worship? What makes it distinct? Christian worship is defined by the presence of the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, and here's the preposition again, in the community, with the community, offering themselves as a means through which adequate worship is offered to the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit. Every time we worship, Jesus is in the house. What would this mean? If we believe this, and I think we must believe this, then what would this mean? I I think we'd quit being so impressed with ourselves. I think we'd quit chasing around after the most entertaining preacher that can hold our attention. I think we'd be less concerned about whether or not worship scratched our itch or not, or gave us goosebumps. I think we'd be entering different tweets when we get to our computers or use our iPhones before worship is even out. I doubt that the infatuation with high-tech media and the latest band would interest us quite as much. I think we'd quit daydreaming and quit jotting notes on our to-do list or texting during church. I think we'd quit piping down about what we like and don't like this song or that song, this style or that style, this preacher or that preacher, and you know why? Because those are the kinds of things that we do when we have no idea that Jesus is truly present. That's what we do. How about you? Do you have any idea? How would worship change for you? If you truly believed that the real presence of the resurrected Lord was actually here to lead you in worship each and every time this community gathered. Christian worship is the community of believers called to worship at a given time who recognize that the risen Lord Jesus Christ in all of his fullness is truly present with us. 
voluntarily facilitating our worship to the glory of God. This was the case this morning when we gathered for chapel. And it is the case every time this community meets to keep its worship appointment with the triune God. I urge you to begin to embrace the reality that Jesus Christ is truly here. The disciples on the road to Emmaus discovered that very thing, eventually. They started out talking about Christ, and then they realized that they were with Christ, and that made all the difference.